Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the webinar for Croydon's parents, guardians and carers about the COVID-19 vaccination programme for 12 to 15 year olds. We're absolutely delighted that you're able to join us this evening and you'll be pleased to know that there's an expert panel who will be able to give you some further information about the vaccine, but also answer some of the questions that you might have. Before we go into the main part of the agenda today, what I really want to do is just say a big thank you to you all because it's been really challenging over the last 18 months and I know that lots of you have been doing things such as homeschooling during the lockdowns and making sure that your children are able to keep up with their learning and I know the schools and for us as an education director we really do appreciate the support that you've given to your children and young people so, so a big thank you from all of us. I hope that you'll find this evening really interesting. We are recording it for those families that aren't able to listen live um, and we'll sure that those of you that are listening will also pass on the information to your family and friends so that they hear all of the relevant information in relation to the vaccination programme. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the expert panel. And of course, I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is Shelley Davis. I'm the Director of Education for Croydon, and it's really lovely to meet you all. I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Dr. Agnello Fernandez, MBE, to introduce himself. Thank you, Shelley. Um, Agnello Fernandez, I'm a GP in Croydon and the Borough Lead for Croydon, uh, South West London CCG and I practice in Thornton Heath at Portmore Medical Centre for the last 32 years. Great, thank you Agnello and we also have James Moore. Thank you Shelley, my name is James Moore, I'm a public health consultant working at Croydon Council, thank you for having me. Great, thank you James and if next if I could hand over to Louise Coughlin. Hello there, I'm, I'm Louise, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm the Chief Pharmacist at Croydon Health Services as well as um, the uh, Croydon Borough of South West London CCG. Great, thank you Louise. And Rebecca Board. Thanks Shelley. So I'm Rebecca Board, I'm the Associate Director of Operations for Covid Response and Recovery at Croydon Health Services and I'm also a practicing midwife at Croydon University Hospital. Great, thank you, Rebecca. And last but by no means least, Una Dalton. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, Una Dalton, I'm the Programme Director for COVID and Flu for South West London CCG. Great, thank you. And you'll have the opportunity to hear from all of our panellists at some point during the webinar this evening. And like I said at the beginning, there will be an opportunity for you to ask us some questions as well in relation um, to anything that you might want to know about the vaccination. So just a couple of housekeeping things from me, just so that we can keep the, um, the, the keep it going nice and smooth. Um, and once I've done the housekeeping, I'll then go through the aims of the session and the agenda. So you should be able to see a PowerPoint presentation and you should be able to see me talking. You'll also see the other panellists when they talk. Unfortunately, what you can't do is turn on your cameras so we can't see you, but we do know that you're there in the background. Any questions that you have, because you're not able to turn on your camera and speak, they have to go into the chat function. And we really do welcome any questions that you have. What we won't be doing this evening is, is publishing any remarks or individual viewpoints, but we will be focusing on questions that you might have in relation to the vaccination. And of course, this webinar is time limited. So if there are any questions that we don't manage to get through, we'll make sure that we include those in a, in a Q&A um, document that we'll publish to our website for you to see. OK, let me go through the agenda next, and that's the key part of today. And I think hopefully you'll see in the agenda that you are going to hear from an expert panel, but there will also be opportunities for you to ask questions. So we're going to have an introduction about the school immunisation programme and content. We're going to have some information from our panellists about the vaccine and the safety in relation to that. And following those two really important parts of the agenda, we'll then be having a question and answer session. And that's the time for you to write those questions into the chat. And we really do welcome you being a key part of this webinar. Thank you very much. OK, I'm going to hand over now to Rebecca Board, who introduced herself earlier. What she's going to do is tell you a little bit about the school immunisation programme, consent, etc. Thank you, Rebecca. 
Great, thanks Shelley. Uh, so as I said, I'm Rebecca, I am Associate Director of Operations at Croydon University Hospital and I've been involved in the vaccination programme since it launched back in December of 2020. So we're here today to talk to you about your young people aged 12 to 15 and you will be aware that the Chief Medical Officers have recommended that all young people in that age group receive a first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Why are we recommending it? Well, we want to protect our young people. We want to keep them in education. We want to protect the communities. So friends and families uh, around the young people who may be transmitting the virus. Um, across Croydon and indeed across South West London, um, we have been vaccinating in schools um, with uh, a programme of uh, rolling vaccination. So our school immunisation teams have been going into school as they do each year, um, but this time we're offering COVID alongside other vaccinations. Um, there are also other ways of getting vaccinated now. So if your young person uh, doesn't get vaccinated in school, perhaps um, you, we've already visited your school or yet to come back or you don't want to wait, that's absolutely fine. We have sessions that are being run in Central. So if you go on to the South West London website, you'll be able to see which clinics you can take your young person to and you can attend without booking. Or if you wish to book an appointment so that you can reduce the amount of time you're on site, that's absolutely fine. You can do that as well. So we've been in and around Croydon uh, vaccinating and also within South West London, um, around 200 schools in and around South West London and quite a number of those in Croydon. What we've been doing is providing parents and guardians with letters which are coming through the school talking about uh, the vaccination and that uh, we as Croydon Health Services are providing the vaccination to young people in Croydon and we were detailing in that letter when we're coming to your school. So what we're doing is reaching out to say if you've got any questions, we'll be available in school the week before we vaccinate. We also make sure that we provide you with an email address if you've got any questions for the clinical team and a telephone number. We also email the um, electronic consent form and we ask you to have conversations at home. So we're asking you to use that as a prompt to speak to your young person to talk about what vaccination means for you as a family, to talk about what to expect and to provide consent in electronic form. When that consent then comes back to the team, we have a look at that and we uh, might make a phone call to clarify some information on it. Um, and if everything is happy, what we do is we come to the school on the day of vaccination. We'll have our consent forms already there. We'll have liaised with the school over which children are coming to the clinic. And we arrive to the, to the school on the morning and we set it up exactly the same as we would in any clinical situation. So we bring all the kit with us, the same as we use in the hospital. So we have computers, we have clinical spaces, we have all the kit we need to provide a safe clinical environment within the school setting. And the reason we're doing that is so that we can make it as easy as possible for your young person to get protected. On the day of the vaccination, we make sure that we've got the sign uh, consent from from yourselves. We also talk to the young people and we ask them. So we ask for their consent on the day and we run through a number of questions. So we will ask them uh, how old they are, for example. We'll ask them if they've had COVID uh, in the last 12 weeks. We'll ask them if they've had any other vaccinations in the last seven days. And we'll ask them how they're feeling, uh, along with getting their verbal consent for undertaking the vaccination on that day. The people that are vaccinating are fully trained, they're qualified and they undertake these uh, vaccination sessions throughout their usual work. So we want to rest assured that on the day your young people will be looked after, their questions will be answered and the uh, experts will be on hand uh, should they need any questions. We also on the day of the vaccination clinic in the schools will be calling parents. So if you if your consent forms on your to do list, you haven't quite managed it. We will uh, be making some phone calls to see if you want your young person to be vaccinated. We want to work in partnership with families to make sure that we answer all your questions and to make sure that we are uh, opening up the clinic to as many people as possible. We will make sure that we speak to your young people about consent, but wherever possible, we will ask for your consent to vaccinate. However, if a young person aged 12 to 15 is deemed competent, they can consent for themselves to undertake vaccination. And when we do that, it's with trained professionals who are used to speaking to uh, young people and assessing their capacity to understand whether or not they can make an informed decision, understand the risks and benefits and wish to proceed. 
What we would really like to emphasise tonight is that we want this to be in partnership with families. We want to encourage conversations at home and make sure that parents and guardians and young people feel they have all the information they need to make an informed decision on whether or not to take the vaccination. We also want to make sure that we make it as accessible as possible and that uh, all our sessions are communicated in good time through our school system. And with that, I will pause there and hand back to Shelley. Great, thank you very much, Rebecca. That was a really helpful overview about the process um, in relation to vaccinations. And I know that families who are listening will have found that really useful. I think it's really also important that, that it's, it's about partnership with families and making informed decisions. And I think that's, that's absolutely key. And, and one of the key parts of this webinar is making sure that you as families are getting accurate information in relation to the webinar, um, to the vaccination. Thank you very much. OK, next I'm going to hand over to um, Agnello Fernandez and Louise Coughlin, who are going to talk to you a little bit more about the vaccine and about safety. Those things that I'm sure that, that you'll find really interesting and, and information that absolutely you'll be wanting to hear. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Shelley. So the last year and a half has been difficult for everybody. Uh, COVID-19 is touched everybody's life in one way or the other. We're fortunate to have a vaccine that can help us uh, uh, fight this disease and when enough people get vaccinated it's harder for the disease to spread, it's harder for variants to develop and also uh, helps people that can't have the vaccines because they're debilitated or their immune systems are weakened. So getting the vaccine protects you, protects your family, protects your friends, and the wider community as well. And it's much safer for the immune system to learn to fight illness through vaccination. And we've known about vaccination for over a century now. And in COVID vaccine is no different. Uh, we've known now more than ever before with all the evidence that's, that's been gathered that it reduces your risk of getting seriously ill or of dying from COVID-19. It reduces your risk of catching or spreading COVID-19 and it protects you against COVID-19 variants if they develop. Young people, just like adults, are also at risk of developing long COVID, which can be a very debil debilitating condition that not only makes you feel very unwell, but can affect every organ almost in your body uh, and takes a long time to recover from. Um, so it's just as important for younger people to have the vaccine and be protected. But even if you've had the vaccine, it's still important to take all the advice, washing your hands, wearing a mask, having fresh air if you're in, in, in crowded conditions, because you could still get the, the virus and still become ill. So on that note, I'll hand over to Louise. Hello there, thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to talk a little bit around um, safety uh, of, the, of the vaccine. Um, and all the vaccines for the use in the UK have been um, tested by the MHRA and approved for use by the MHRA. There has been an unprecedented collaboration worldwide to get these vaccines actually approved um, in, uh, uh, more, more quickly than you would normally. The technology that these vaccines use has been around for a long time. Messenger RNA technology has been around for a long time. Um, what we do know um, from, from the research from, uh, uh, from, from the trial data um, that the adverse um, um, effects, the side effects from these vaccines tend to be very uh, mild and transient. The most common ones being um, uh, injection pay, uh, in pain at the injection site, normally um, only last one or two days. You might get um, fever and headaches. Again, they're normally quite mild, they're self-limiting and they're short-lived. So um, I think um, the, uh, the, the, the side effects that you get in children are very, very much um, similar to those in adults as well. So um, I think that, uh, um, the, uh, that there are some more um, rarer side effects, but again, the, the, the risk of, of those is, is very, very low um, and is outweighed often by uh, the longer term effects and the effects of actually having COVID itself. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much to both uh, Dr. Agnello Fernandez and Louise Coughlin. Really interesting information there, and thank you very much for providing lots of facts in relation to the vaccine itself, but also safety in having the vaccine. I think really important points that you've made there. Um, can I say thank you to everyone for listening? Now, we haven't got lots of, of PowerPoints to share with you this evening, because what we really wanted this webinar to be about was the opportunity for you to ask questions, to, sh to share with us any questions that you have in relation to both the process that Rebecca has talked about, the safety of the vaccine, as, as Louise has talked about, but also general updates about um, how the vaccine can, can support families with reducing spread, as, as Agnello was talking about. So, I'm going to I'm going to share the questions. I'm going to read them out and then I'm going to hand over to our panelists to answer. And after we've done the question and answer session, what I'll do then is I'll go through the next steps. So thank you very much. OK, the first question we have is why only one dose has been offered and not two like in other countries? If traveling, the 12 to 17 year old would need to do a PCR as if not vaccinated, as they are not exempt. Oh, a really great question to, to start off the question and answer. I think I'm going to hand over to Louise to answer that question. Thank you, Louise. Lovely, thank you. Yes, so um, currently, as it, as it stands, 12 to 15 year olds are only going to get one dose, um, but 16 and 17 year olds, um, um, as of sort of next week, will be able to get their second dose 12 weeks after their first dose. So that is a change. Um, in um, in the recommendations um, when they started looking at the data that's been been around. Um, the, the reason that we tend to give one dose at the moment is looking at the risk and benefit of giving um, two doses for, um, for the effectiveness of the vaccine versus the side effects. Younger people do tend to have a better immune response and therefore the, the response that you get to a single dose is, is very good and at the moment they, they feel it's sufficient. That's not to say that that position might not change, and there may be a recommendation that children get a second dose, but as it stands, the feeling is that the response to the second dose, uh, to, to, the, to, to one dose, is, is sufficient. Um, but you will see some more information coming through around 16 and 17 year olds requiring or um, being now eligible for a second dose 12 weeks after the first. Great, thank you very much, Louise. A, a really comprehensive answer to that. And I hope that that was helpful information for you, Christina. Um, and thank you for asking the first question on our webinar. Um, we've also had some questions that have come in advance of the webinar. So I'm just going to take one of those questions now. And that was, how are children supported in school after they've had the vaccination? Again, a brilliant question and one that I'm sure that lots of, of families would like to know the answer to. So I'm going to hand over to you, Rebecca, for that question, if that's OK, as I think that links very much with the process in relation to the vaccination. Absolutely, Shirley. Thank you. And yeah, it is a great question. Uh, I'm a parent myself and that is something that I would ask myself um, because we want to make sure that our young people are looked after and whether they be at home or at school, we want the best for them. And uh, one thing that we can assure you is that we look after them like they're our own. So uh, we absolutely are used to working with young people. Um, we appreciate that every child needs something a little bit different and that for some children having an injection is absolutely nothing. And for others, uh, it worries them and uh, they can have a bit of a wobble and they need a bit of a different approach and our vaccinators are used to working with children and they are used to making sure that they are behaving in a way in which your child needs so we have things like private areas we um, make sure that we've got water and we've got biscuits we make sure that we've got chairs so you may be aware that after you've had the vaccination so we're talking about the Pfizer there's an observation period. So uh, when we're in schools, we um, say hello to the children. We make sure we know who they are. We ask them a set of questions. We go through the verbal consent. We make sure that they're happy to have the vaccination on that day. We make sure that we're happy for them to have the vaccination on that day. Uh, we then uh, proceed to talk to them about the, the vaccination. We ask them which arm they would like it in. Uh, we administer the vaccination and then we observe them for at least 15 minutes. So what we do is once they've been vaccinated at that station, they go to a, a waiting area that's been set up, usually in the school hall, where they 
are looked after by a healthcare professional. So um, some children uh, are absolutely fine. Some children will need a, a little biscuit because it, you know it's it can be quite eventful when you're that age. Um, but what we do see is that children have been very very well behaved. They've been very respectful. Um, there's been some really good um, conversations. And on the whole, what we're experiencing are children are really proud to receive the vaccination. Uh, they want to um, do their bit. Um, so we've had some really positive conversations and engagement with our young people. If children aren't quite ready to go back to the classroom, that's fine. We work really closely with the schools and with the um, uh, school's nurse and the pastoral team to make sure that each child has what they need. We appreciate that we're meeting your children probably for the first time, whereas the school know your children, they know what they need. Uh, they also know where they're going back to and the quickest route to get there. So um, the schools have been really supportive and the children have been great. Um, and uh, if you're a bit worried or you think that your child doesn't like needles or you're worried about how your child would be during the session then that's why we've got our helpline that you can call or our email address where you can reach out to the clinical team um, we're more than happy to uh, look out for certain names or you know have a heads up about how your child may need us to be on the day um, what we want to make sure is that you feel comfortable that your child feels comfortable and they have a positive experience i'll hand back to shelley Great, thank you very much, Rebecca, and, and really providing that reassurance that we need as, as parents when we're making this decision. You know, I'm here as the Director of Education, but I'm also a parent as well of a 17 year old who took herself off to have the vaccination um, and, and was informed and, and uh, made that decision. I'm really proud of, of her for making that decision, um, but also was looking after her when she came home to make sure that I was really clear about anything I needed to look out for. So um, really, really good question and, and great to hear that reassurance from you, Rebecca, about how well the children and young people will be supported in school, because that, that's so important for us as parents isn't it? Okay, I have another question. Thank you very much. We'll keep the questions coming in. Um, another really good question and I think I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to direct this one to Una actually. It's why is there a drive to vaccinate children if they don't get COVID too badly? And I wonder if Una you might be able to, to take that question and we might hand over to a clinician as well. Yeah, certainly. I think a clinician will probably add more to it, but it is about the wider protection of our, of all community um, rather than just themselves and their and their families as well. Um, but I don't know whether Louise or Rebecca would want to answer that one. Yeah, I think Una, you, you're spot on in that um, we recognise that um, COVID on the whole for children is less severe than it is in adults, but um, it it's still a pretty nasty virus and we need to recognise that. And actually some of the side effects of COVID can be quite significant. And what we're trying to do is make sure that we protect our young people and that we limit the spread of the uh, disease. As Agnello speak, spoke about in his slide, this is about making sure that we get things under control. Uh, we try and stop the spread and that we protect as many people as possible. Great, thank you. Louise, did you want to add anything or are you happy for me to move on to the next question? I think I think Rebecca answered it perfectly. Great, thank you. And, and again, we're getting some really good questions here. And these are questions that everyone who listens to this webinar will want to know. And I think that's so important. So I'm going to go on to the next question. If we as parents want to have a second dose for our 12 to 17 year old, can we get it or does the government recommendation need to change first? And I'm really thinking about who to answer that question because it's not necessarily a clinical question. It might be a little bit more about the programme. So I think probably you, Una, but again, we can invite our clinicians in if necessary. Yeah, um, at this point in, in the programme, we're not, um, the government advice is not to have a second dose for this cohort, so we couldn't make that available at this point. And we would have to wait for any further guidance from the JCVI in order to do so. And of course, if there is any change in guidance, you know, we, that, that sort of information does, does um, come out in the news, doesn't it? And it is published and, and we will make sure that your schools get that information as well so that they can they can hand that over to you. So great. Thank you. Again, some really good questions um, that people are highlighting. I just wonder whilst we're um, just in a, um, a brief interlude, whilst we're awaiting our next question, James, if you could just give us a little bit of an update about sort of the Coiden context, because that might be helpful for people that are listening. 
Of, of course, thank you very much. Um, and yes, uh, what I can say is um, sort of COVID is very much still with us, unfortunately. Um, we are still seeing cases of COVID uh, day, day to day, and we do have cases in the hospital. Um, I, so in the last week or so, we have had around 893 cases of COVID in Croydon, and the previous week that we had data for was 940. Um, the most recent data was from the uh, week ending the 11th of November. Um, in terms of of what we're seeing in the community, we are still seeing cases in our schools and we in public health as well as our colleagues in education and across the NHS are supporting the teachers, head teachers in um, sort of con trying to continue the, with the education and ensuring that sort of school days are, are disrupted as little as possible, whilst also ensuring we reduce the spread of COVID. One of the things that we're saying to everybody, as you will probably be aware of as sort of parents of children in schools, is one of the things we can all do is make sure we're testing regularly with our lateral flow tests um, that everyone should have available. And one of the key things we can do is if we're going to see somebody who's particularly vulnerable, say a grandparent or somebody we know who has an illness, we do a lateral flow test beforehand just to make sure we're not unwittingly taking uh, COVID into that environment. As everyone will know, sort of COVID has some symptoms which can be seen, cough, high temperature, loss of, loss of smell and taste. However, a lot of people will not have symptoms, which is why it remains important to keep testing. And it also, as others have said, it's, it's so important that we consider the vaccination we get ourselves vaccinated so we protect those people that we are coming into contact with every day. Um, I think I'll hand it back to you there, Shelley. Great, thank you. And that's really helpful, um, James, because we're not just talking about the vaccination here, we're talking about COVID, aren't we? And, and actually, what other things can we do to keep ourselves safe as well? So that was really helpful. Um, we've got a really good question next, and I think what's going to be helpful is to do a little bit of explanation around the question as well. So. Um, I'm concerned about the increased risk of myocarditis for boys taking the vaccination. Can you provide evidence that the benefit of the vaccination in healthy teen boys outweighs the risk of myocarditis? Thank you. Thank you very much. Really important question. So I'm probably going to hand over to both Agnello and, uh, sorry, Dr. Agnello. I feel like I should call you Dr. Um, Agnello and Louise to answer this question. And what it might be helpful to do, because we'll have people who are listening today who don't necessarily know what myocarditis is, to, to give a, a little bit of helpful information around that. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. That's a really good question. And People read about all the, the side effects, the common ones, but also rare ones. Uh, myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, and it's not the same as it would be in, in older people and uh, young people recover from it. Uh, it's it's, it's self-limiting in many ways and it's very, very, very rare. Everything, every, anything you do has a risk and myocarditis is one of those risks in young, young people. Um, but if you think about <clears throat> why we're vaccinating people, it's not just only to protect society, it's to protect, it's to protect that individual child. So if that child gets COVID and they're ill, they're going to miss a lot of school. They're, they're also going to not be well themselves and themselves. <clears throat> and so it's important when balancing the risk of common or, the, or, or even rare side effects, we take it in the round, uh, what's the benefit to the individual? And even though it may be mild disease in, in younger people, uh, it could be quite debilitating. And, you know, at the end of the day, it, there's no way that uh, in, we're going to be giving any medicine or vaccine to any child if we think that the risks outweigh the benefits. Um, and in this case, myocarditis is one of those conditions, uh, but is, is, is transient and uh, children recover from it. And it's extremely rare. And as some of you may know in the news today, the guidance has changed as well, uh, which reduces the risk of myocarditis even more. So one of the questions that will be asked is, have you had COVID in the last three months? Uh, um, uh, so that uh, there is a gap between the time you have a positive PCR test uh, or, or you have COVID uh, and, and, uh, and you have your first 
you have your COVID vaccination if you're 12 to 15 year olds. So that minimises the risk of uh, myocarditis even more. So I think going forward, that risk is reduced hugely now and the benefits hugely outweigh uh, the risks, not only for the individual, but also in terms of the, uh, the family, the uh, friends and wider society. Bound to be muted at some point during this webinar, aren't we? And talk. So apologies. I started talking before I'd unmuted myself. So um, thank you very much, Agnello. A really detailed um, answer to the question. And, and there will be people here who will have individual questions about their own children. And I think it's really important, as I'm sure you're all doing, is, is having those some of those follow-up questions and, and conversations with your GP directly as well. Um, Louise, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, not, not really, no. As, as Agnello says, what, what we're weighing up is the risk of the side effects of the vaccine versus the risk of the side effects of having, having COVID. And um, um, the, the, the incidence of myocarditis in the UK appears to be something like 4.3 cases per million vaccinated. Um, but there is also a risk of developing myocarditis with the, vac with the, with the COVID, um, with the coronavirus it, um, disease itself. So we do need to weigh up um, both of those. It's one of the reasons why we're only recommending one dose at the moment. It's the reason, as Agnello has said, is why we're recommending a 12-week gap between getting um, coronavirus disease um, and getting the vaccination. So there is that risk versus the benefit. And that is not just with vaccines, it's with every medicine. You look at the risk of taking the medicine versus the risk of what the disease is that you're taking that medicine for. And it's exactly the same as that we do for all medicines that we prescribe. Um, I can cover a bit about some of the other side effects, although the myocarditis was the one I was thinking of when I was talking about rarer side effects. Um, but I can cover a bit about that if you would like me to. Well, that's really interesting. And it, it could be like we've written this, couldn't it? Because the next question actually is from Jane. And Jane says, could you say a little bit more about other potential complications of having the vaccine? The ones you said were rare. Um, so I think that that does segue nicely into to you giving us a little bit more information about that, Louise. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, to be honest, um, the, the, the rare one that I was thinking about m uh, in the main was the myocarditis. When you look at the sort of the side effects that you get from the um, from from Pfizer, the ones that um, a lot of people have, like the sore arm, muscle pain, um, chills, and tiredness, are the very common ones, which tend to affect about one in ten people. Less common are actually redness at the injection site, nausea and vomiting, um, and then. Um, uh, more un uncommon um, side effects might be um, insomnia, um, uh, allergic reactions such as, such as a rash or it, uh, itching. And then the very rare ones are actually going to be more severe um, allergic reactions like, like swelling um, and so on and so forth. Um, we don't know the exact data about the, the incidence of um, severe anaphylaxis, but we do know it's very, very rare. Um, and again, we don't know the exact um, data on the um, incidence of uh, myocarditis and pericarditis, but we know it's approximately sort of 4.3 per million. But those are the sort of things that, um, I, guess, uh, that I was thinking about when I was talking about sort of the, the, the common and the less common side effects. Thank you very much, Louise. And of course, you know, um, when children are having the vaccination in school, those things are highlighted so that families can keep an eye out on, on any of those things in, in children, which is great. OK, I'm going to go on to the next question. So this is because you have admitted the government isn't allowing second dose for children. Can you explain why not? And I wonder if I could come to you, Agnello, um, first of all, in relation to that question. <coughs> so. Uh, as more information is known, not only in this country, but across the world, uh, um, uh, decisions to give the vaccine, the dosing uh, and the younger age groups, is uh, we're learning a lot more. Um, and because the, we know about the common side effects, and we also know about some of the rarer side effects, and how can we minimise even the rarer side effects, uh, is one of the elements in that in that equation, but more importantly, it is about uh, knowing that children actually have a very good immune response. So from, from uh, in terms of what do you need to prevent you being uh, becoming seriously ill or, or, or dying, 
and we know that children have a very strong immune response and, and uh, 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 just one dose uh, does give them that. Uh, we don't know how long that lasts at this stage, but we know it lasts many months. Uh, and I think at this moment in time, we'll probably be going to a uh, second dose as more evidence is, is gathered. But at this moment in time, we know that one dose gives them adequate protection against the disease. And so that's why it is, uh, it's, 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 as the recommendations say. Um, there was another question also that asked, what are the long term side effects, long term effects of vaccine, of the vaccine? Now, this is a very common question people ask, and there's a simple answer. Is there ever, is there been any vaccine that's ever been invented that has long term effects? The answer to that is simple, no. Uh, and the, the vaccine only stimulates your immunity against a specific uh, uh, pathogen. Um, uh, and just like all the other vaccines that we've ever had, uh, this is specific to the, the COVID-19 virus. So uh, we don't anticipate long term uh, side effects. Great, a really, really helpful overview. And we're having some really good questions coming on the chat. And I know um, for myself as a parent, these are questions that I'm really, really enjoying listening to and, and really interested in the answers. So thank you for the detail that you're providing. I'm going to go on to the next question, and this one's going to be for you, Louise. Is this vaccination effort for 12 to 15 year olds also going to be worth it for possible future variants? Or is it true that some variants of the virus were coming as a result of the vaccine? Uh, thank you for that. And then uh, if any of my colleagues want to tip in and help me out with this one, then they can do. Um, what, what, I, what I do know is when, when the vaccine was being developed, what they did look for is the, the, mo the bit on, on the virus that most variants might contain. So the bit of the virus that we use to um, generate an immune response is the, is the spike protein. It's a, bit, it's a, it's a spike on the, on the outside of the virus. Um, and they chose that because um, a lot of the variants still um, are, are likely to um, uh, uh, present that, that spike protein and therefore the vaccines um, will be effective for it. However, there is a lot of monitoring going on, looking at the variants that are here and the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, and there are a lot of the, the, the companies that are producing the vaccines will also be looking at how they might want to adapt um, their vaccines to make sure that they are um, continually um, effective um, in, in the long term. Um, what I'm not sure about is um, the, 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 the variants that are coming out as a result of the vaccine. That's not normally what, what would be the case, but um, Agnello can help me out there. Yeah, so certainly there's no evidence that the vaccine is creating uh, variants. But we do know, and the whole reason why we're having a vaccination programme is to reduce the amount of circulating virus. Because as long as there is circulating virus, because people are not vaccinated and so they're transmitting more between people, then there's a, a greater opportunity that you will have uh, a virus which becomes a variant. Which and, and you know the worry of everyone is if you've got a variant that escapes the vaccine, and so it's really important uh, to reduce the amount of circulating virus in the community by vaccinating as many people as possible, so that you reduce the risk of having any variant uh, that cause trouble. Great, thank you very much. Really detailed answers and, and what we hope is that by having the answers that we're giving on the webinar today, it will help you make an informed decision about the vaccination, which of course is really important. So we've had a number of questions. What I'm going to try and do is draw some themes together um, to ask one main question. It's really around the, the personal benefits to children in terms of having the vaccination beyond those that are benefits to the wider community. So I think that's, that's you know, question that's a, it's a theme that's coming through quite a lot of the questions so I'll, I'll sort of repeat that again is what are the personal benefits to children to having the vaccination compared to the wider benefits that we've talked about um, in relation to the whole community and I wonder um, if um, Agnello we've got lots of questions coming um, for you this evening which is great so if we start with you Agnello and then perhaps Rebecca might want to come in and, and give a little bit more information as well thank you great questions thank you Uh, I covered that earlier in terms of uh, why individual children and um, 
even though they don't get ill if they seriously ill if they get the vac uh, they get the, the, the virus they get infections they they can still have long covid they can still miss school and so the individual benefits are huge and so even if you think about the wider impact of being vaccinated on their families and on wider society the vaccine protects them and also protects everybody else uh, so uh, wh why wouldn't uh, why wouldn't i give my child a uh, vaccine uh, um, um, uh, um my children are a little bit older than 12 to 15 now but if that, if they were i would have no hesitation at all in recommending them uh, having it i mean that's what i've said to all my relatives who do have children in that age group as well uh, uh, we know uh, the safety profile it's safe uh, we know it's effective uh, we know that it does uh, uh, what it says on the tin in terms of protecting people uh, uh, children uh, and it, you know i think parents worry about what happens if they miss a lot of school and that has a huge impact we know what happened during lockdowns and and, and that's not something we need to we want to go through but the question about variants is a really important one and the more more people that we can get vaccinated and we know there's a reservoir of of, of virus in, in younger people and if we can get them vaccinated as well we reduce that reservoir we reduce the chance of getting variants which affect everybody then including including the, the younger people so i think the overwhelming rationale for uh, for for vaccinating the younger children uh, is quite clear Right, that's really helpful and I think you know we've lots of uh, lots of people on the, the the chat have asked that question I think that's really important in helping people uh, determine and, and have the right and accurate information to, to make that decision so that's really helpful um, I'm going to go on to the next question because the, Rebecca this is one for you and what you might want to do is answer this question and then um, add anything in in relation to the benefits to, to individual children but you know, really great questions that we've got coming so this um, person says good evening what percentage of Croydon pupils have come forward for the Pfizer vaccine please my child and our family would be more likely to take up the offer if we knew we were not in a minority. The adults in our household are vaccinated, but we have some trepidation with having our child vaccinated. Really great question and, and probably one that lots of, of families will be wanting to raise. So I'm going to hand over to you, Rebecca, to respond to that one. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, so at the moment, what we're seeing is in the schools that we've visited, our uptake in those schools is around about 23%. Um, and that, it sounds like a low figure, but there's quite a lot operationally that you need to deliver when you're going to a school. So that isn't that a cut off at that number. That's what we've got through so far. Um, you can appreciate that some schools in our borough are quite sizable and going into school and vaccinating the whole of the cohort is just not doable in one session. So what we're doing is we're going back so that we can reach more children and that we can also reassure parents. What we are seeing is that when we started the programme, um, the appetite was probably not as significant as we're seeing now. So we are seeing more and more families as the programme goes on, probably because people just like yourselves are getting that reassurance from others that they're not alone um, and we've seen the uptake increase. We're also seeing that um, when we're making phone calls on the day to parents, we're able to have a one to one conversation and we're actually having parents say, do you know what, I, I do want you to vaccinate my child. Um, so I think it is about having the information, having the reassurance and like you say, knowing that you're making the right decision, that you're not alone. For your individual children, and we've talked a lot about society and, and reducing the spread of the virus, which is absolutely correct. Um, but we also need to recognise that COVID presents a risk for children and that there are, um, you know, rare side effects of COVID. But they exist, you know, again. So myocarditis isn't um, a side effect of the vaccination for no reason. It's a side effect because it's a side effect of COVID. And the effect, the side effect of getting COVID and uh, myocarditis is actually increased. So to summarise that separate, a different way is that if your child was to catch COVID, there is a risk that they could go on to develop myocarditis. So it's not as if um, the vaccination and myocarditis are, are um, uh, an anomaly. Uh, the, the risk is that COVID could lead to myocarditis. So vaccination is protection. By vaccinating, we're reducing risks. So we're reducing the risk of the individual catching the virus and reducing the risks of the associated risk effects or side effects of the uh, infection. So 
what we say to children is that um, these are the risks, these are the benefits. On balance, you know, where do we sit? And that's what we're saying to parents. We've got information leaflets as well, and we've got lots of information on the Southwest London CCG website. What's really, really important is that if you have questions, and tonight's a great example of how you can get those answered, is that you find your answers from a, a point of, of information that you can trust. And um, what I would always say is that um, if you're not sure, the World Health Organization has some great resources and we link to those on our Southwest London website. So if you if you're not sure you want to seek out some information, perhaps after this webinar, you can reach out to us on an individual basis and we will answer your questions. Or if you want to go and do some fact checking, then do that through the, the um, websites I've mentioned. Shelley, that's really that's really helpful, Rebecca. And actually, I took advantage of that, Rebecca, and I contacted you and asked you a question, didn't, didn't I, and got a really helpful answer. So I do encourage you, um, if you do have any individual questions, to take advantage of, of the ability to ask someone on an individual basis. Really helpful. I'm going to use Chair's prerogative here and, and just ask a question myself, if that's OK. And it's really on the back of the last question we had. So if as a parent, when you had the letter from your school, you, just, you didn't consent to your child having the vaccination but you've changed your mind when the vaccination team come to your school for a second time are you able to to fill out a different form and, and for your child to have the vaccination Rebecca absolutely so what we say is that the offer is never off the table so um, what we want to do is if we have to come back to schools three, four, five times, we will do that because that's the right thing to do. It's about making sure you've got the right information in the right format. You feel that you've had the time to have your questions answered and make the decision. Um, you might not want to wait for us to come back to your school and that's absolutely fine, in which case that we have got mechanisms for you to book a vaccination for your child. So the national booking system, uh, it's uh, um, if you Google it, you will find it or link through the Southwest London website. You can go on there and you can get a, a booked appointment at a location of your choosing. What you can also do if you visit the Southwest London CCG website is you can look at when we're holding the clinics in, uh, for instance, Central for 12 to 15 year olds. And we do this because we have ring fence time where we have paediatric trained nurses who are able to sit with your child, sit with yourself, explain the risks and the benefits in a calm and controlled way and make sure that you've got the time you need to make that decision, have the vaccination, have your observation time. And actually places like Central mean that afterwards, you know, you can go off and do uh, what other you, things you want to do. So and for some families, it's important that the parent might want to attend with the child or for the child. It might be important that the parent or guardian attends. And that's absolutely fine. So we've got mechanisms in the borough that whatever it, your family needs, we will have an avenue to be able to meet your needs. Oh, so helpful, Rebecca. And, and again, I think you know it's really important that for some parents who want to be with their children when they have the vaccination, that there is the opportunity to do that. So thank you for outlining that. OK, when I come to these questions, I'm sort of doing a bit of should I ask Agnello? Should I ask Louise? So I think the next one I am going to come to you again, Agnello, but I'm sure Louise might want to make a comment as well. So the UK has now around 70 percent of total population fully vaccinated, but still having roughly 40,000 new cases on a daily basis and the winter still to come. Why do we continue to see this number of cases with such a great rate of vaccination? Really great question, thank you. So it would probably be good for James to answer this from an epidemiological point of view. Uh, do, okay. do you want to take that, James? Um, yeah, sure, happy to. Thank you, thank you um, James. Dr. Um, so. Whilst we have 70% of the total population fully vaccinated, as you say, um, that isn't actually high enough to stop the transmission of the disease around the country. Um, first of all, so first of all, we we're not yet high enough to see it fully stopping it. Um, and as you've said, and sort of winter is still to come. Yes, indeed it is. And with winter brings more mixing. So people who maybe haven't been mixing are now being potentially exposed to the illness and they haven't been exposed to that over the summer period when we were locked down and we were spending time outside. Um, and so sort of going back to what I said earlier, um, to reduce our risk, we can open windows, let air in and sort of refresh air and ensure that we're still maintaining some distancing. Um, but ultimately at 70 percent and with the with the numbers we're seeing, we haven't yet got enough people vaccinated to see it really stop that. 
And we've got to remember that we may have to live with COVID for a while yet. We unfortunately cannot vaccinate our way out of everything. And we have conditions like flu, which every year we have a booster um, because it is present in the community and stays there. And that's why we have to sort of think about how our immunity lasts long over the long term. Do we need boosters to push that up? And sort of we've mentioned, uh, Agnelis was mentioned earlier a little bit about the um, sort of different strains and the importance of sort of how the vaccine works with them. And we may need sort of new boosters to sort of help with different strains as they come along. But ultimately vaccination itself will not um, sort of prove the answer um, unless everybody was vaccinated. We don't yet know how many people we would need to get vaccinated to stop the transmission and we don't know whether it would stop it because unfortunately what we have seen over the last year is that even if people have been vaccinated or they have had the infection they may have it a second time. But what we do know is that the vaccination will stop those people from having to go to hospital and reduces the risks of the serious side effects. Uh, I don't know whether Louise or Dr Fernandez would like to add anything more to that. Thank you, I'm not. Uh, you covered it. <laughs> Great, thank you, James. A really detailed answer. And, you know, some of the questions that we've got aren't just about 12 to 15 year old vaccinations. They're really about vaccinations in general, which is helpful and, and a, a really detailed answer. So thank you um, for asking that question really really good questions and, and they keep coming which is great so the next question is how long does it take for some immunity to develop after the vaccine please I think that's probably a Louise question yeah, I was expecting that thank you I mean it, it normally kicks in after about about two weeks um, it, it, the, the vaccine is, is about your own body producing um, antibodies um, and activating T cells and so it, it, it's a couple of weeks um, and then you start getting your immunity working. Great, really helpful. Nice, uh, nice, uh, simple answer to that one, which is which is helpful. Thank you. Um, so the next question again, really important question, and this one's for you, Rebecca. How long do you have to monitor the side effects of the vaccine in your child? Yeah, it's a great question. So obviously we do the immediate uh, 15 minute observations and what we're looking for is to make sure that they don't feel a bit faint after an injection and that there's no serious allergic reaction. Um, after that, and we're happy and content, we send them back to class or you might be a go off shopping, um, at which point we just say to watch out for um, anything that, you know, it is um, uh, more than a, a, an achy arm. So the things you'll be looking out for would be you might have an achy arm, it might be a bit sore to move, they might feel a bit headachy um, or just a bit kind of um, achy or flu-like. Most of those symptoms are mild, not everybody gets them. Some people get some, some people get more. They usually last 24 to 48 hours. Um, the rare side effects that we've spoken about tonight usually present within the first 10 days. Um, so it is quite a short window. Like I say, you know, I'm I'm a mum, my children have been vaccinated and um, they still had to do their chores on the day of vaccination, I can confirm. Great, thank you, Rebecca. And for any parents that are concerned about the vaccinations, of course, you know, contacting your GP to talk about those um, is, is always helpful, isn't it? So thank you very much. Great questions. The next question is for you, Louise, a really short question, but is the vaccine halal? Oh, sorry, I didn't manage to un, un, unmute then. Um, yes. Yes great. is the answer. OK, great. Thank you very much. OK, so we've had a really, really good range of questions um, this evening, haven't we, around myocarditis, which we now all know a lot more about and understand about the vaccine itself. Is it halal? What side effects do we have to look out for? What's the purpose for my individual child about having the vaccine? A whole range of absolutely brilliant questions. Um, and I hope you found the webinar really helpful. Um, there will probably be, as a result of this webinar, more questions. Um, and whilst we won't do those tonight on the webinar, there is the opportunity for you to have a look at the Q&A document that's on the website, but also for you to make contact with either your GP or the various ways that you can access further information. And I will talk you through those now. So in terms of next steps, what we just want to say to you is, is 
thank you very much for listening to us. You know, hopefully this has been useful for you. Uh, we hope you feel that you've had the opportunity to, to ask a question this evening and that you've had a really, really good fulsome answer to those questions that have been asked. So how do you make a decision then about the, the vaccination and whether or not um, you move forward? So you will get a letter um, via email from your child's school and that has a consent form on it. And it's really important if you're making the decision to vaccinate your child that you complete that consent form. And as Rebecca said earlier, if you didn't fill out the consent form on the first visit to the school, there's nothing stopping you from filling out that consent form um, and changing your mind or making a decision to have your child vaccinated outside of, of the school building in those various places that you can walk in. So if you would prefer to take your child to one of the walk-in centres, you can use the website, which is www.southwestlondonccg.nhs.uk and you'll get more information there about where those walk-in centres are. And you don't just get information about the Croydon ones, because it might be that you are able to go to one in another local authority as well. But if you do have any further questions and we, we've answered lots of general questions this evening and you might have questions about your individual child and, and your individual circumstances, you can go onto the website and have a look at our Q&A document, which is on the same website, www.southwestlondonccg.nhs.uk or you can email directly Croydon get involved at southwestlondon.nhs.uk and that might be the place where you email if you've got those individual questions. But a, a huge thank you to our panel this evening, you know, great experts that we have um, on the panel, Dr Agnello, MBE, we have Louise, we have Rebecca, we have Una, really fantastic answers and, and I can't forget James as well, um, our public health consultant. So really, really detailed answers, lots of expert knowledge, we hope you found it really useful um, and we hope what you'll do now is spend some time having a, a think about whether or not you're going to move forward with the vaccination for your children aged 12 to 15. Um, thank you very much and I'd just like with the panel like to just say thank you as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you thank for you. having me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you.